Hey guys, it's Miss Batty here, back with lesson five in our series on populations and resources. What you're going to need for this lesson today is a pencil or pen, some paper that's blank or lined to get your ideas down on, and if you have the packet pages that go with this lesson, it would be a great time to go grab those right now. Something that's optional, but if you have it available to you, I would su suggest that you pause the video and get logged into the Populations and Resources digital model in Amplify. If not, no worries, we'll be able to go through everything together. Last time, we started to collect some evidence to help us to understand what might be causing more births to occur in a population. We know that in the moon jelly population, there are more births than deaths happening but we still don't fully understand what is causing that change. Did the births increase and cause there to be this change or did the deaths decrease? Right now, we are focusing on births and how they change in a population. In our previous lesson, we did an investigation with different uh, types of energy with yeast and saw that when more energy was available, the yeast seemed to grow more. We also took some observations in the digital model and noticed that there is energy tanks under each of these different organisms. And these energy tanks or energy storage molecules are changing in number. They're decreasing as these organisms were reproducing. We also saw that crickets, just like the yeast, also were producing more births or occurring more reproduction when more energy was available to them. What could affect the ability of an organism to reproduce? We know that it has something to do with energy, but why do these organisms need energy storage molecules to reproduce? And where is this coming from? Today, we are going to read an article titled, Reproduction Requires Energy. In a moment, you are going to read chapter one with me. Then you are going to go ahead and pick one of the other chapters to learn more about. If you have access to the articles, you can go ahead and read them on your own, actively annotating, um, looking for new ideas, and to answer our question of what is causing more births to occur in a population and what does this have to do with energy? However, if you do not have access to the digital or to the articles, I'm sorry, you can listen to the recording that I have done in a separate recording where I read through the first chapter and the following chapters. So everything is available to you. Let's get started with reading the first chapter together. In my class, as we read, we like to do something called active reading strategies. The first thing that I'll do is something called a title prethink. This allows us to read the title and start to have our own ideas about what might be occurring in this article. We usually then do an article pre-scan. Now I'm not gonna do this today, but this is a really quick scan of the text to look for words that are coming up over and over again, or words that we are unfamiliar with. We also use, usually highlight our unit science words. This acts as a kind of marker to help us figure out where there's a lot of science words in the article. These are our unit science words so far. I encourage my students to circle unfamiliar words or new ideas and write themselves annotations of definitions, notes, aha moments, or questions. The goal from this is to get evidence about our question. And so if we find any areas that seem like they could be evidence to help us understand what causes more births in a population, I'm gonna encourage you to underline those portions. Okay, let's get started with chapter one. Reproduction requires energy. So in my title prethink, I already have the idea that reproduction is requiring energy. I, I heard about these energy storage molecules, um, but this is hopefully gonna break it down to really help us understand 
why reproduction requires energy, what it's being used for, um, and how these organisms get this energy to do this reproduction. So let's get going. Reproduction is a lot of work. Some organisms travel thousands of miles to find a mate, the right place to lay eggs, or the right spot to give birth. They might work hard to attract mates using songs, movements, and other displays. Now, I'm gonna circle this part because this is kind of a new idea to me. I hadn't really thought about the fact that organisms might need to use the energy even before they're giving birth. They're traveling, they're um, laying the eggs, they're working hard to attract mates, they're moving around, having other displays to attract their mates. Other organisms might fight fierce battles to win. It looks like that is what is happening here in this image of these elks. The male elk fight one another for the chance to reproduce. So again, even before the females are giving birth, reproduction is requiring a lot of energy from both sides. Often this is just the beginning of the job. Many organisms work hard to protect their eggs find food for their young, and do everything else that may be required for successful reproduction. No matter what an organism goes through to reproduce, the process requires lots of energy. In fact, for many organisms, reproduction requires more energy than anything else in their lives. Now, I underline this part because it seems really key to reproduction and understanding how organisms give birth. I didn't realize that it required so much energy for organisms to give birth. Some don't even survive reproduction. It requires so much energy that these organisms reproduce and then die. Whether reproduction is relatively easy or extremely difficult, every organism needs energy in order to reproduce. Without energy, there can be no reproduction. So that looks similar to what we observed with our yeast. We saw that the yeast with no sugar or no energy storage molecules was not able to grow or reproduce. This also was confirmed by looking at the cricket investigation, where we saw that the more energy that the crickets received, the more eggs they were able to lay. As we know, organisms get the energy they need from energy storage molecules, such as glucose, starch, and fat. These molecules store energy that can be released in the bodies of organisms when they need it. I underline this part because this is an interesting idea that these energy storage molecules can actually be stored for the purpose of reproduction. Plants and other producers can make their own energy storage molecules through photosynthesis, but other organisms can't do that. To get energy storage molecules, they need to eat food. I underline this part because it's, it's really key to understanding where this energy comes from. We also, to make a connection, just learned about why we need so much energy. It's not just the act of giving birth. It's the mating, it's the protecting the baby, laying the eggs, protecting the nest, creating a safe space. And again, we have figured out an, a kind of key idea here that the way they get these energy storage molecules is through eating for most organisms. What is food really? Food is the body parts of an organism that contain molecules, such as energy storage molecules, that other organisms need. Consumer population, hmm, I'm gonna circle this because I haven't heard of it before, is the term ecologists use to talk about a population that eats other organisms for food. So this seems like another word almost for this word predator. I saw some of my students talking about the predator of the moon jellies, um, and, and this seems to be something similar. It's the thing that is doing the actual eating. Ecologists call a population that is eaten for food 
a resource population. So again, this is the thing being eaten. Every consumer population gets its energy storage molecules from a resource population. So if we look at the image here, it seems to show, and, and it reminds me of the digital model where we see that food web overlay um, that there's arrows between. That must be telling us about what is eating what. It seems that the arrow is pointing towards the thing that is doing the eating. And that's probably because it's receiving those energy storage molecules from this resource population. Interesting. So what I encourage you to do now is pause this video and go read one of the other chapters for yourself. Again, I want to remind you, if you do not have access to the articles, then there should be another video recording titled Ener Reproduction Requires Energy, where I have read through the articles for you. Enjoy! Hopefully you got to explore a little more about one of the organisms in the reproduction requires energy. We have so much evidence that we have collected about our question of what could be affecting the number of births in a population. We have our investigation with the yeast, where we saw that there was a changing amount of growth depending on how much sugar the energy storage molecule that we gave to the yeast. We saw this replicated with our crickets. The more energy that they were given, the more eggs they were able to produce. We know that energy is involved because when we look in the digital model and read the article, we can see that energy storage molecules play a key role in reproduction. I want you to pause the video for a moment and think about all of this evidence that we have collected. Can you summarize it into one to two sentences? What can we say about what is affecting the birth rates in a population? Yes, those are our key concepts. Organisms need to release energy from energy storage molecules in order to reproduce. We know now that it is the whole process of reproduction, from the time of finding a mate, to protecting the eggs, to actually giving birth. All of this requires energy. We also know the more energy storage molecules available to a population, the more the organisms in that population can and probably will reproduce. We saw that there is a way to show what is eating what and where energy storage molecules are coming from. This is called a food web diagram, and it shows what is eating what in an ecosystem. We have the resource population feeding into the consumer population, showing that the foxes eat the voles. Can you think of some other examples of resource and consumer populations? Pause the video for a moment, and if possible, find a family member or friend. What can you come up with? Hmm. You might have been thinking about some of the different articles that you read. The different articles introduced us to four different type of organisms and their resource populations. The salmon eat the shrimp to get energy to reproduce, the elephant seals eat the crabs, and the emperor penguins eat krill, firefly larvae eat snails. We gained evidence that more energy storage molecules means more reproduction. We know that most organisms get these energy storage molecules from eating other things. What I would like you to do is investigate in the digital model how you can increase the number of energy storage molecules available to a population. Let's take a look at the wee bugs, for example. If you have access to a digital model, it would be a great time to pause the video and to start investigating on your own. What can you do to change the number of births in the wee bugs? 
to increase their births through giving them more energy storage molecules. If you don't have access, no worries, follow along with me and we will take a look together. The first thing we need to think about is what is our test? How can we increase the number of births in the population? Well, the moon jellies, if they are increasing, are probably increasing in their number of births. And so that's what we're gonna try to do in the digital model today. Can we increase the number of wee bug births? That will be our responding variable, also known as the dependent variable. So what are we going to do to be able to figure out what's occurring here? What we can do is mess with or manipulate or change the number of green leaves in the digital model. This will be considered our independent or also known as the manipulated variable because it's the thing that we are going to change. We can either choose to increase or decrease the number of green leaves. We also need to make sure we have some controlled variables, things we don't mess with that won't interfere with our results. I'm going to keep the number of fur bills, the other organism in the ecosystem, the same. I also am going to make sure that I leave things alone for 20 time scales, make my change, and then let it run for another 20 time scales so we can be sure that time has nothing to do with our evidence collection. If you have access, go ahead and get there, pause the video. If not, let's do this together. So here I am in the digital model. And again, we are going to use our three populations um, sim. So if I click in here, um, we're gonna let it run for 20 minutes or time a time period of 20. <coughs> Um, and during this time, I'm going to be thinking about, so I'm going to pause it. Okay, so it went to 22, so I'll make sure I let it go to 22 after. Um, but what we are going to do is try to increase the number of births in the wee bugs. So we are going to change something about the green leaves. I can either choose to manipulate this by decreasing the green leaves or increasing. Now we have figured out that the wee bugs are getting their energy from the green leaves. So I think I'm going to try increasing these and seeing whether because of this increase, they will start reproducing more. Let's take a look. So I almost doubled the number of green leaves. We're gonna lock it in. Again, we're leaving the fur bowls alone and I will let it play for another 22 minutes. So that'll get me to 44. All right, so I'm gonna pause it and of course we need to analyze our data. So let's get back over here to about 22 before I did anything. Before I made any changes, and I'll, I'll even go back one to 21 just so we can see right before. I am seeing that the wee bug population was at 104. During that time, 27 had been born. So it seems like gradually over time, 27 wee bugs were born. At this point, we'll see that I increased the number of green leaves in the population. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens. I want you to pay special attention to this number in here. Does this seem to be going up by a lot more than 27, right? So if we were to get to the end and it had double 27, that would mean that the number of births stayed pretty consistent. But let's take a look. Wow, if we see here, I mean, we really can see that the wee bugs are shooting up and by the end here, they've had a total of 88 births. Now, if I think about this, 88 births in the end, 88 births, so this is uh, what it ended at. 
minus the 27 births that we had in that first time chunk, I get that 61 births happened in that second time chunk, right? So at the beginning, right here, we had only 20, 27, I believe. Yeah, about 27 births that occurred in this time. But from this time point, all the way to this time point, so this is the same amount, we had 61 births, meaning that the number of births went up by 40 when we added all those green leaves into the population. This is really interesting. So what I think we can conclude is that when we increase the resource population, this is the thing that causes there to be more energy storage molecules available for our consumer population. By increasing the population size of one group, you can affect the births in another group. Think about what this all means. How can changing the births affect a population size? An increase in births always leads to an increase in the population size. An increase in births leads to an increase in the population size if there are more births than deaths. Or an increase in births lead to an increase in the population size if there are fewer births than deaths. Let's take a moment to think about this for ourselves. Okay, you probably noticed that we have our keywords from one of our previous key concepts. That an increase is related to, again, the relationship of births and deaths. Although it may seem that if a lot of births are happening, there will be an increase, we can't forget that also deaths are occurring in a population. And this is where we are going to look at next. We know that it is possible the number of births in the moon jellies changed. Now we are going to think about what might have occurred to change the number of deaths in the moon jellies. I look forward to seeing you again in the next lesson to continue our investigations. See you later.